Our next uh, presentation, our next speakers, uh, come from Seattle. Uh, we have uh, Chris Anderson, the director of the Domestic Violence Unit in the Seattle City Attorney's Office, and Sandra Shanahan from the Kings County District Attorney's Office, and they work together on a Domestic Violence Firearms Enforcement Unit uh, that, um, well, I'll let them talk about it, but I was doing a little research on this, and the statistic that just really leaps off the page is the collection of 466 <laughs> Uh, firearms in 2018, um, you know, and the, and the just the, the flow of crime reduction and the ability to kind of protect people from themselves um, that I think that that uh, enables. And if I have my data right, and they'll correct me if I don't, um, it's a fourfold increase in uh, the enforcement of firearm surrenders than just two years prior. So clearly, this is a program that has taken hold, that is effective in uh, unifying different parts of the criminal justice system to work in tandem to um, go into challenging situations and help make them safer. Um, and I can't wait to hear more about it because it sounds fascinating. Uh, Chris and Sandra, please come on down. As John mentioned, um, I'm Chris Anderson. This is Sandra Shanahan, who's the program manager of the Regional Domestic Violence Firearms Enforcement Unit. It's a multi-jurisdictional, uh, city, county funded program that we put together as a pilot initially in 2017 to remove firearms from domestic abusers. Uh, it initially was started um, before there was an extremist protection order law in the state of Washington. That subsequently passed when we were in our pilot phase, and then we have uh, assumed that work as well. I assume that many of your jurisdictions are, I know that there's like 16 states this year that are um, considering red flag laws or extreme risk protection orders. And so some of the things that we talk about and some of the barriers and difficulties that we had removing firearms from individuals uh, relate directly to uh, implementation of those laws as well. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the statistics I know that <coughs> It's a room full of prosecutors. I know that people know that firearms and domestic violence is a, uh, is a terrible intersection of, and is an incredible risk to victims. But um, some of the statistics when Sandra and I first started this work in a work group in 2016, um, even though we both had been working in domestic violence for, and Sandra for decades and myself for at least a decade, uh, we're kind of overwhelmed by the statistics. And so I wanted to share some of those with you. And then we want to talk about how we got the program started, the successes of the program, maybe some case examples if we have time. But we do encourage you to ask questions during the process. Uh, I think it's more important that we answer your questions than to get through all the material.
And now these these statistics are um, you probably heard these before, um, and they're I mean they're very sobering. And it was something that really drove uh, the policy in the state of Washington to really, if they wanted to have a significant impact on reducing domestic violence homicides, firearms was the focus. Firearms was, firearms was the key that they really need to focus on. Um, and there's really basic two. There's really three basic principles to that. That is something that we push through with this work. Is first of all, domestic violence abusers have the highest recidivism rates. The single greatest predictor of future violent crime is prior domestic violence history, and that's from a study of over half a million um, uh, inmates uh, through probation, and they show that they were actually um, twice as likely to commit a violent offense than someone previously convicted of robbery or kidnapping. So you take that initial uh, recidivism rate and then you add on top of that that um, when, it, when there's a recent separation, there's, it's 45% of DV homicides happen in the first 90 days of any separation in the relationship. And most of those are occur because of an arrest or they occur because of the, the issuance of a uh, domestic violence protection order. 75% um, happen outside of, within six months and only 13% of domestic violence homicides happen outside of a year of a recent separation. So you have this short window of time of lethality that is very important. And, the, and, and then you add a firearm to that situation, and then you have this, the highest risk of a lethal outcome. And the really, you can't really do much about the recidivism rate. Um, you can't really do much about the victim and the separation, but you can remove this risk factor. And that's why we're looking at more of a public health approach and in in the spirit of the innovation in the sense as the first time as a prosecutor where we're trying to look at the data, we're trying to remove risk factors before something happens. And what we found is at the time that the issuance of these protection orders uh, with the recidivism rates of, with defense with prior domestic violence history that the best thing we can do is to act quickly. And our system uh, at the time when we were doing these work groups um, was not set up for that. It really did, wasn't, it was a reactive system Something had to happen, and then you went along this, this process. What we needed to do was find how to, we could react quickly, we could remove risk factors, and we could reduce harm, both to the victim and to anybody who was charged with the, we're not charging people with the crime, our focus was not charging people with the crime, it was basically removing these firearms uh, before something happened. And this is just to show that actually, in addition to the recidivism rates that it's that they're actually someone previously convicted of domestic violence is twice as likely to reoffend than someone previously convicted of uh, felony robbery or kidnapping. Also, um, this is a study actually in Philadelphia which of police officers um, that shows that police officers are most at risk responding to domestic violence disputes actually three times more likely than responding to a uh, 911 call for a man with a gun or shots fired. So after decades of pressure, actually the, the uh, fatality review board in many states have a fatality review board that review DV fatalities for 16 years had recommended that to reduce risk domestic violence homicides was to remove firearms from offenders. Finally in 2014 that passed under pressure with, from advocates um, and the community. Um, but then what we found was after a year after the 1840 was passed, which required that anyone subject to a protection order had to turn in their firearms, had to surrender their firearms while that protection order was in place. There was no funding allocated uh, in that legislation for implementation, no agreement between jurisdictions about whose responsibility it was to do that, uh, and no mechanism of enforcement. <clears throat> so essentially, victims were in court getting orders of protection. The courts were telling them that there, there's been an order to surrender firearms. And there was no one telling them essentially no one's going to follow up on these orders and nothing's going to happen. The only thing we would do is if someone was arrested, they would be charged with unlawful uh, possession of a firearm. But there would be no efforts made to remove those firearms before. Um, this was a snapshot of the, of the compliance um, showing that we had. So the only thing that the court did was they set a review hearing. So there would be an issue of protection order. The court would set a review hearing two weeks out to make sure that they had turned in their firearms. And essentially, it was a civil process. No one showed up. Maybe a handful of people showed up. And this kind of reflects just a snapshot of, like, I think, four people filed paperwork. 
and the paperwork is just what we call paper compliance. We have no idea whether they turn their firearms in. We have no idea if they have firearms. They just find a, sign a declaration saying they don't have firearms at the advice of their attorney, and they're somehow in compliance. Um, I have another clip here. And a, a local news reporter in Seattle was interested in this topic because he knew about uh, protection orders and the surrender laws, and he did a, a small a piece on it. And it gives you an idea. I think it's a, it's a very short, like two minute piece, but it gives you an idea of where we were in 2016 with firearm surrender. In 2014, Washington legislators passed a law that was supposed to ensure that people served with protection orders actually turn over their guns. The law requires those people provide the court with a receipt showing that all firearms have been surrendered to police or sign this declaration swearing they don't have any guns. Apparently, and they're saying there's an allegation that you possessed weapons. But at this recent King County court hearing, the law proves as empty as the courtroom. On the door outside, 34 people who have not responded to weapons surrender orders are scheduled to appear before the judge to explain themselves. 34 but only three show up. King 5 reviewed this court database of a thousand protection orders granted last year in which firearm surrenders were required according to the 2014 law. In 47% of cases, the columns that should contain responses from alleged abusers are blank. Nearly half the weapon surrender orders go unanswered. What do you think of that? I think that's unacceptable. I see today's situation as playing Russian roulette with the lives of victims of domestic violence. William Braun is a former federal prosecutor who now volunteers his time representing high-risk domestic violence victims. Cassie is one of his clients. He says the criminal justice system should punish abusers who don't comply with weapon surrender orders by finding them in contempt. I have actually asked for that in court and that has been denied. Are judges being firm enough with these people to get them to respond? I don't really think it's a question of the firmness of the judges. I, I don't think that's the issue. Both the current and the past chief judges of the family court say they're committed to getting guns out of the wrong hands. We know that firearms magnify the threat. The judges say many of the accused may not have been served with a surrender order, a requirement before it can be enforced. For those that are served, they say contempt orders and arrests only work with the help of police and prosecutors, and a task force is studying that right now. And about the high number of no-shows at their firearms review hearings. I don't think that's really unusual. I think maybe people would be surprised at how often people don't comply with court orders. You know, there was a promise made to uh, victims when the legislation was passed. And that was, not only will we issue a protection order to you, but we will get the guns out of the hands of your abuser. And that promise is not being kept. Bill Braun's always good for quotes. He's always got good quotes. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to pick on the judges in this situation, but clearly you can see the, some of the apathy of uh, the judges in this, that they're just like, hey, so people aren't following these, what are we supposed to do about it? And that was a big problem. Uh, it was a big problem in the beginning. I think that one thing about getting, you know, one thing, good thing about bad press is it helped move the policy a little bit because we initially had started coming to these review hearings as prosecutors, but we don't really have any standing. They're civil hearings. We're not a party. Uh, the courts were not willing to really listen to what we had to say. They didn't want us on the record. After this, they kind of wanted, me, they wanted to see what we could do. And I think this, um, you know, it's not a terrible piece for them, but it also kind of highlights that they're getting a little bit of the blame. And if, 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 uh, if the judiciary is taking the blame, they're happy to have the prosecutors come in and maybe take the blame instead. So that was one thing that kind of moved it forward for us to let us come in, take that responsibility, and it helped move things along. One of the great things that we did, we're able to do, was because of the judges wanting to get more information, because the judges don't have access to the information they have, they have no investigative resources. Um, so when someone comes in and tells them they don't have a firearm, they really don't know, they, other than they're having their criminal history. Uh, as you know, the purchase history for firearms has tons of holes in it, it's not accurate. Um, I think our, our state was behind by 500,000 uh, 500, 
receipts for guns that had not been put into the database. So there's really no way for them to be accurate about whether someone does or doesn't have firearms unless there's an investigation. <coughs> so so we, we got what's called an amicus from the court, and the court allowed us to appear to provide information to the court uh, about the firearms, um, and, and, that's, and that's where it went from there. So. In 2014, in 20... So, during this time when this piece came out, we were already engaged in work groups. Uh, it was myself, Sandra, uh, the county uh, DV head, David Martin, um, and we had court staff, we had judges, we had um, uh, PR screeners, we had everybody we could find that, is, that were stakeholders in the system to figure out how we could enforce HB 1840. And it's a very difficult process because during the during the year and a half of meetings that we had, every every new meeting was a new barrier about how we were going to go do this enforcement, the difficulties with the enforcement, the resources, the budget. It was really time-consuming uh, work. And what what we really came down to was we had educated ourselves on the risk and worked ourselves into kind of a frenzy, knowing that there's this huge risk, and then knowing every day that these review calendars were going by and no one was doing anything. So at one point, David Martin, who is my colleague at the county, came to the hearing and we, or came to one of the meetings and we had, they had found out that we just, our budget was gonna go through. We'd asked for money to dedicate a prosecutor and an advocate to this work and it was denied. So we essentially said, we have no money, we have no uh, resources, we don't really have any capacity, but we're gonna go to these hearings, we're gonna sit in the back of the courtroom and we're going to see as prosecutors what we can do. And um, we kind of surprised ourselves. We went to one hearing on May 29th of 2017, and um, it was there were 34 people on the calendar that were supposed to provide proof that they'd surrendered their fire. <coughs> two people showed up. Uh, of those two people, we immediately, once they started talking, we followed up on them. Within uh, six days, we did a search warrant on one case, but within six days, we recovered 11 firearms from those two people, from three people that were on that calendar. Two that showed up and one that didn't show up but we followed up on. And it was as easy as making some phone calls. One, one we called a victim and she said, oh yeah, the guns are right here, you wanna come pick them up? And then one we executed a search warrant and got seven firearms from another. And one of them was actually a jail guard and we called his employer, he turned his gun in that day. So we were able to kind of parlay that success. And, it, and to give you some context of 11 guns, we had recovered 52 guns the entire all of 2016, we recovered 52 guns that been turned in out of thousands of protection orders. So we recovered essentially almost 20% of the firearms from the previous year in one in one calendar. So we took that to the city council and we and we showed them that you know it's much more compelling to go to them and say like listen we got a plan it actually works so give us some money rather than give us some money and we'll see what we can do with it. So um, it was a really big watershed moment for the work that we were doing and helped us really get. Uh, future funding. On the March day that Dr. Thomas appeared for this his fire test hearing, cases. he told the judge he had no guns, a conversation recorded by the court. There was an allegation that you had a handgun. We've had a handgun years ago, and nobody, she's never seen any handguns on me. Thomas signed this form swearing, I do not have any firearms. But the one day that Michael Thomas appeared in court was unlike any other at the King County Courthouse. Um, and, then, and then from him we recovered seven firearms. Um, and as you can see, like, being a prosecutor and sitting in the room, you can kind of know who's telling the truth and who's not. And that was, that was really a big moment for us because we, we have the criminal justice system that works. We do have search warrants, we have law enforcement. Um, we just needed to put together a team that was able to do that investigation up front. And we also got a bunch of advocates together too, who basically work as investigators as well. And, I'll, and the next clip is to show you kind of really where, how we built a, a culture of compliance and where, in contrast to the first one where you see the judges saying like, hey, if people don't follow orders, what are we supposed to do about it? Um, this is a, these are some clips from uh, a recent hearing. Before we start the session, Gina Mitchell presiding. There's an allegation that you had a weapon in your waistband. There's an allegation that you possessed a gun last year. The petitioner indicated that he twice threatened to kill her with a 
gun, pointed it at her, and cocked it in front of her children. What's happening in this King County courtroom is leading to more of these ending up in the police property room. These firearms belong to accused domestic abusers, many of whom tried to hide them from authorities. So all these guns were recovered either from a search warrant or by people that served the protection order. Sergeant Dorothy Kim of the Seattle Police Department's Domestic Violence Unit is part of a new task force hunting for guns that would have previously gone undetected. What's the likelihood that any of these guns would have ended up in police hands? None. None. A year ago, none of these guns would have been recovered. We would never have done the search warrant. This is just about whether you have the guns. That's all we think this is about. So God just made a big out of that big Okay. Firearms hearings like this one specifically target people who are served with protection orders. She indicated in the petition that he has a handgun that he keeps in a specific place in the house. The police and prosecutors on the Regional Firearms Task Force interview victims and witnesses and even obtained search warrants if needed to get an abuser's gun. He had threatened her with a gun. The firearms are usually loaded. There's been threats to kill, strangulation, rape, stalking. Instead of relying on the word of accused abusers, the court now hears evidence collected by the task force. We also have information that there are seven to eight other guns at the property where he was at. That's our crime scene analysis people to make sure that if we serve the search warrant that we have and put resources to get everything out of there. We're walking into a court hearing right now where a judge is going to determine whether a number of domestic violence suspects have to surrender their firearms. There are 24 that she's going to rule on today. This is the hearing to make sure that they have complied with either surrendering their weapons or filing a declaration of not surrender saying that they don't have any firearms or access to any firearms. Have you had an opportunity to look at your order to surrender weapons, sir? Yes, uh, ma'am. Yesterday. On April 30th, 2018, you signed a declaration of non-surrender. Do you remember doing that, sir? Yeah, I don't have any okay. Is this your signature here, sir? Yeah. While in custody, Officer Nichols reported a statement. Uh, I'm going to blast that motherfucking apartment. I don't have a permit, but that doesn't mean I don't carry. Prior to this position, I was a trial attorney and did um, domestic violence cases. And so I dealt with the aftermath. The incident had already happened. Now the team has the opportunity to act before um, that something happens. And the important aspect of uh, the investigation part, and I know many of you work in domestic violence as well, is that there's a different cooperation level with a victim who's gone in to get a protection order versus a victim who is called 911. Uh, at that time, they're much more willing to cooperate, and when you have a trauma-informed advocate who's contacting them, uh, they do usually do have pretty recent information about the possession of firearms that is helpful for either search warrants or for these hearings to where we can present um, to the court that we are aware of their, them having firearms, and they usually uh, facilitate surrender. Um, this is a great picture of, uh, of, of what it looks like now. So you saw the other picture where there's like two people in the courtroom. Now it's basically standing room only. We've really pushed this, this culture of compliance, but that's not really the only thing we do because what we've started to realize is that even this process is a little too late to get the firearms. This is often two weeks after a protection order is issued. So we've developed a program where we start to receive both criminal cases that have firearms um, and, there's, and the person prohibited, domestic violence protection orders, and extreme risk protection orders come into our office ex parte before the, the defendant's even notified that there's an order in place so we can conduct our investigation on the front end. Effective enforcement is obviously making risk assessment. I think in most jurisdictions, we, even we don't have the capacity to do all of the cases. It's thousands of orders that are issued in the district courts and out of the superior courts. We only have to focus on the most high risk cases. So we have to have effective uh, people who can make risk assessments. Um, we've developed model policies. There's actually 43 agencies in King County Police agencies in King County all operating differently, uh, all their own policies and procedures. And one of the great things we can do is put together model policies for them to um, enforce firearm surrender. Uh, a law passed in Washington State um, just last year that requires officers to ask victims of domestic violence if there are any firearms in the home on, and can respond to any 911 calls and we can remove those firearms uh, before even the defendant's released after a mandatory arrest. It's the, it's the best time to get them. It's the least risk to officers and to the victim. 
and, and cre obviously creating the regional team is the big part of doing this is obviously the jurisdictional boundaries don't stop with uh, domestic violence and with firearms. Often victims come in to King County to get protection orders from all over the, all over the state really because they have uh, advocate services to help them provide them. Well, there are victim advocates that are on staff to help them with their protection orders and get them in place. And so this is a this is a quick clip of uh, it's, it's it's not the full clip. We have a longer video if, if anybody's interested about about our model, about the harm reduction model, how we approach our cases. The following is a brief summary of the regional domestic violence firearms enforcement units harm reduction model. There are three fundamental phases of enforcement. Number one, referral and review of surrender orders. Number two, risk and assessment and staffing of referred cases. And three, execution and removal of firearms. Number one, referral and review. There are three primary types of cases received by the firearms unit for screening. Emergency protection orders, criminal cases where a firearm is identified, and extreme risk protection orders. The first type of case are protection orders which are reviewed daily by the firearms coordinators before being forwarded to law enforcement for service. Second are criminal cases where an order to surrender is issued with a no contact order and firearms are identified in the police report by the filing prosecutor or victim advocate. And third are petitions for extreme risk protection orders requested by law enforcement. The firearms coordinators review the documents related to the case to determine if there is a firearm concern. Once the firearms coordinator has determined that the case is firearms positive, the victim is contacted immediately. The firearms coordinators function as both advocates and trauma-informed investigators. They investigate the abuser's access to firearms by asking targeted questions, such as when firearms were last seen, the location of any firearms, and a description of the firearms. They also integrate safety planning specific to domestic violence and firearms, and offer domestic violence education and referrals to community resources. After the firearms interview, the firearms coordinators gather additional information on risk and firearms from other sources, such as the offender's firearm purchase history, criminal history, pawn history, or hunting license information. They interview witnesses, prior victims, review previous protection orders, and police reports, and review social media. Number two, case staffing. The firearms coordinators select the highest risk cases for case staffing with the unit prosecutors, advocates, and law enforcement to determine the best course of intervention. Intervention can take many forms, from executing a search warrant, filing criminal charges for noncompliance, increasing bail on a pending case, or setting a review hearing. It also includes creative interventions, such as calling a defense attorney to arrange for and encourage voluntary compliance, asking for a declaration to account for firearms that were sold or transferred, and even appearing on the record at a civil hearing to provide information to the court. Number three, execution and removal. The unit has a dedicated team of detectives that serve protection orders and execute search warrants. If the abuser is not already a prohibited possessor, the serving officer will request that the respondent voluntarily surrender all the firearms to the serving officer at the time of service. Equipped with the information gathered by the firearms coordinators, the officer can say, for example, you need to surrender the gun that you keep in the ottoman next to the fireplace. I can take it for you right now. Which has a bigger impact than the court says you have to turn in your guns. This has been the unit's most successful way to disarm abusers. If the firearms are out of county or out of state, the unit forwards the investigation and relevant information to the law enforcement agency in that jurisdiction to assist in removal. 
And I'm going to pass it off to Sander now to talk about kind of where the firearms unit is now. And um, it's been in operation now for two years. And she'll. Next question while you're doing that. Yeah. Has there been any risk or actual retaliation uh, against victims for them cooperating and saying where the guns are? So um, that's something that the advocates are factoring in in all of their communications with the other person. And we've definitely had done outreach to specific victims who don't want any part of this. So they're kind of self-selecting into the process. Surprisingly, um, about 95% of the people that we do outreach to are absolutely on board. And they've never in their life had anybody specifically ask them about firearms and, and then offer to help with the recovery. So I think that's a really critically important question. So as John mentioned, um, since our operation began in January of 2018, we saw a 400% increase in the recovery of firearms. And as Chris had mentioned, only 52 firearms were surrendered in all of 2015. And, and that literally was a respondent getting served with a civil order, the police walking away, and that individual saying, oh, I better go take these in. And so that kind of honor system is really problematic for risk. And so we're really proud of the effect that we've had so far in proactively removing at the time of service in as many instances as possible. So in our first two years of operation, we've collected, recovered, or assisted with the surrender of over 1,100 firearms. And as you heard in one of the videos, one of the most important things that we do, because we don't have enough resources to cover every, you know, all 2,000 cases that we've handled to the same level. So we identify cases of fi as firearm positive or firearm negative. And just when you really get to geek out in this area, you find um, different disparities. And one of them is that our rate of firearm positive cases is about, it varies between 40 and 50% of all of our protection orders. And if you contrast that to what public health found, our local public health did a survey of firearm possession rates in all of King County. And what they found is that the general population, only about 21% of people possess firearms. So when we talk about people who already pose disproportionate risks in recidivism and they're armed disproportionately um, beyond the general public, we have a big problem. And I think one of the things that's most important in this conversation is that we're not just talking about risks to the victim or the protected party. We're also talking about risks to children, their family, law enforcement, the community, and what we've all seen in all of your cases, if you do domestic violence cases, is risks to offenders themselves, and that's in the form of suicide. We've had uh, several just in the past several months. So just wanted to go through a couple of our different kinds of cases so you can get a sense of what they are. So this one was really interesting. It was one of our early successes in the beginning of our unit. This involved an individual who fled her um, state of residence in California because of pretty horrific domestic violence where her abuser was loading his rifle and holding it up to her, threatening to kill her, putting the rifle in his own mouth, threatening suicide. Um, he shot and killed her two puppies in their backyard and also um, was just not afraid of the police and felt like he could kill her at any moment. She fled to Washington filed a local protection order with the order to surrender weapon, which is how we learned of the case. Simultaneously, because she fled, this individual started harassing her family members in California. The family pursued their own type of order and asked that he have to surrender his, his firearms. He said, I don't have any firearms. California had no independent evidence of him possessing any firearms, so it kind of ended right there. But because of our outreach from our victim advocates to this petitioner who was terrified that he was going to come up here and harm her, um, she got really great information about where the firearms were and um, what he possessed and where they were kept in California. So our advocate brought this to our weekly case staffing and said, this is a really high risk case. What can we do? And our 
kind of first instinct, I think, you know, six, eight weeks into our operation was, oh, this is, this is in a whole different state. Like, what can we even do? And so our advocates, um, being ever the advocates they are, said, well, what if I just made a phone call down to California and just see what I can accomplish? And so we couldn't say, don't do that, because um, it just seemed like, you know, it's a shot in the dark, but go for it. So she called down to the local police department who got her in touch with the California Department of Justice, who was very interested in that information. And they, in fact, um, pursued a search warrant, found the guns exactly where she said they were going to be, arrested him, charged him with unlawful possession, and he is now convicted of that crime. And so it really inspired us, and I think what we realized is that firearms don't know jurisdictional boundaries. And if you silo your approach of like, I'm only ever going to recover in the city of Seattle or in King County proper, you're going to miss half your cases. Domestic violence is about people fleeing for safety. And so we've had cases, um, we've called Texas, we've called Montana, we've called across the country because that's where the respondents are and that's where their firearms are. Uh, this is a more recent case uh, that was pretty high risk. We intercepted it right up front when the individual filed for a protection order. And as Chris said, we can't wait till the review. That can be several months afterwards, and it, there's always an opportunity for the respondent to hide weapons or come up with some creative story about a voting accident where their firearms disappeared. Um, and so on this one, we knew up front that this was a situation where this respondent could potentially uh, barricade, uh, put law enforcement at risk, so we really needed to be thoughtful in how we presented it. But this individual was homicidal and suicidal. He'd come home from work, strap on his bulletproof vest, strap on his rifle, and sit at his window and aim his rifle at people as they walked by. Super high-risk situation. He had urges to kill people, he was a chemical engineer, knew how to make bombs, um, just like ticked every single box that you could think of. And so by sharing that intel directly with our detectives, we were able to disarm him immediately upon service. Um, and it was really <coughs> instrumental in making sure that everybody could remain safe in that situation. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Well, this one's kind of interesting because um, this is a bragging rights photo that one of our uh, respondents filed just to show his buddies what his arsenal was. And this is an individual who's super high risk, also threatening to shoot his, his um, one of three ex-wives, or all three of his ex-wives at some point. But he also engaged in uh, lots of road rage incidents. So this is him, um, was upset with the driver in front of him, zoomed up and behind, threw his car in park, jumped out with the car still running. Um, I don't know if you can see, he has a firearm on his hip. Um, but this is an individual who had known um, homicidal and suicidal ideation and knew that he had mental health concerns and purposely said he would not get help because he'd rather keep his guns. I'm going to skip these two. So extreme risk protection orders, how many states who are represented here have extreme risk protection orders? One. Fun. Okay, interesting. Are prosecutors in your jurisdiction assisting on them? Yeah, um, I'm from New Jersey. It was oh, just instituted yeah. September 1st. So we, you're just getting into I it. I had the first one in the state of my county. Right. Well, it's great that you're, and actually, I think you have to be involved in New Jersey on the purpose. Yeah. Is that correct? Yep. That, we met somebody, a colleague of yours, uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of months ago. And so this is an area where we focus a lot of our attention. Uh, our extreme risk protection order was passed by a citizen's initiative in 2016, and as Chris said, we just kind of absorbed it because it's looking at high-risk firearm-related work. So we absorbed it, and it's really a focus on, it's a civil order that restrains somebody from access to a firearm, CPL, they can't purchase or possess. And it's, it's intended to be used in situations where someone is posing a significant risk of harm to themselves or others. Um, so one of the big things that we heard originally when there was conversation about extreme risk protection orders is that there's gonna be gross government overreach, where this is gonna be a gun grab. 
And I, I want to say that in all of 2018, King County pursued 71 ERPOs, which when you compare it to our total population, that's 0.002% of the population. Um, but what we found in our analysis of our extreme risk protection orders is they are disproportionately being filed by law enforcement. So we believe that family members are not aware of this option, and so we really want to work hard to make sure that families who have people in crisis are aware that this is relief that they can see. I love that there was a focus yesterday on data and using research-informed practices. And so we need to know what we're encountering. So we did a breakdown of our extreme risk protection orders and found that the majority are um, people who are, if you combine these threats to self, um, we've definitely seen cases with threats to others. Um, and then the combination of cases. So to break this down, we've had, I, I think this first top, this top one is really interesting. We have an ERPO inbox that we created where anybody can email us with personal situations or questions or our law enforcement can consult with us. And the first one was literally an, an individual who had just moved out of state. He had broken up with a dating partner that he lived with. And uh, this individual woman was sending him uh, suicidal texts, basically saying she wanted to commit suicide. She had taken a photo of herself in a firearm uh, dealership and took a picture of the gun that she was going to use to end her life. And so this individual was just really alarmed and worried for her. And he reached out to our ERPO inbox. And we connected with him, uh, encouraged him to talk to law enforcement. And thankfully, he was able to reach out to a law enforcement agency that had, that was very well versed in extreme risk protection orders. So they were able to take all of the facts, do it in through their own vetting pr um, process, and determine that they would pursue it. And the court did grant an ERPO in that case. Did she get help? Uh, so order. So I think you're hitting on a part that's a big problem. We, the statute allows the court to order people to get treatment or counseling for substance abuse or mental health, but there's no funding. So that is a significant gap in people being able, it's great, we can take the firearms temporarily um, and reduce that risk, but we're not in a place where we're actually giving people the, the need, the um, meeting people's needs in that regard. So that is definitely a gap. Uh, these are cases um, where people's conduct at the time of the criminal investigation um, arose concerns about their access to firearms. So in all of these cases, these individuals were not going to be prohibited from firearms pre-trial. And so the ERPO was sought to make sure that they were not able to possess or purchase. And then we have this other interesting uh, thing that we've started to encounter. Um, if you look at this bottom one, where people are, we knew after Parkland that, individ, that, that ERPOs were being used as a potential way to intervene to prevent a mass shooting. And so over the past two years, we've definitely had instances where it seemed like we could intervene and, and maybe prevent something. This one was the most marked in being an actual threat of mass shooting. So the respondent's girlfriend brought him into a hospital. Um, basically afraid that he, because he was threatening to commit a mass shooting um, bigger than Las Vegas. The hospital staff had a duty to warn. They immediately reached out to law enforcement. Law enforcement reached out to our prosecutor, and they staffed it, and they um, filed a protection, an extreme risk protection order in that situation. But these cases made us feel like, um, this case actually came at the same time as a really important report. Did anybody read this? This is fascinating. And one was just published yesterday about school shootings by the US Secret Service. And the really important parts of this are um, 24 of the 27 mass attacks that occurred in 2018 involved firearms. Three were vehicles. The other thing that was really important is that it, how many people do you think were already prohibited from possessing firearms who committed those mass acts? None? Um, uh, like 10. 10 of the 24 were people who were already prohibited from possessing. And that means 14 people 
possess firearms legally. And so we have this kind of national narrative that we've got this track of good guys with guns and this track of bad guys with guns and these paths never cross. And I think that what we've learned from this is that those paths do in fact cross at times. Um, there was also an <coughs> ideology piece, even though two of those cases were, um, only two of the, all of the cases had specific ideological um, issues. There were, a third of those cases had people who um, had anti-Semitic views, white supremacy, conspiracy theories, sovereign citizens, animal rights, and the incel movement. And so we had, we felt the need to create a framework in our office to receive those cases and kind of handle them differently um, so that we could uh, figure out how best to address it. So this is our working defini definition of ideologically motivated violence. And so we're using that and tweaking it, and we've actually had two cases just in the past two months that fell within this. This is the first one. This one hit national news a couple of weeks ago, and it involved a neo-Nazi who was threatening a race war. And he was recruiting other people to engage in hate camps where they literally were using high-powered firearms, discharging live ammunition on public and private land while they were chanting race war now. And this individual had been detained and is banned from life in um, from going into Canada because of his affiliation with this um, known domestic terrorist group. And while our deputy faced a very, very uphill battle when she took it to, to the hearing to get the extremist protection order, the court ultimately granted it on the basis that it appeared that the respondent was inciting violence. Um, but it also helped that the respondent did not appear. And then we had another case um, just in the last couple of weeks when the Joker premier um, was scheduled to take place at, in early October. Law enforcement in our area and probably throughout the country was doing a threat assessment, looking at social media and any other indicia that there may be risks of uh, shooting that would occur during the premiere. And uh, a local law enforcement agency came across this individual. And if you can't read it, it's an, obviously an individual with two AP-47s under the tagline, one ticket for Joker, please. So we staffed that, we looked at other social media and kind of like looking at this, very concerning, but was it enough? And then we came across this. This was a post that this individual had made in 2017. And I'm just gonna read some of the things that he had said. So people have heard about incels, the involuntary celibate movement, men who feel entitled to relationships with women and feel like they get to cause harm when they're not that. Um, so some of the things that he wrote in here were, I really wanna just punch a woman so hard her entire body just buckles and collapses. I will shoot any woman, any time, for any reason. Dear ISIS, please execute every non-incel. Kill all women, and then prowling the Seattle streets for women to assault. No luck so far. Hopefully my urges will be satisfied soon, among many others. So this person really created a risk profile that we worried about and felt like we had to intervene and try to disrupt something that might happen within 48 hours of our initial learning of the case. Um, unfortunately, when we went to court, our judge did not feel that our prosecutor had proved by a preponderance of the evidence that this person posed a significant risk. So as disappointing as that outcome was, we really felt like we had done the right thing. And one of the most important things that the Secret Service report said is in 78% of the mass attacks that have already occurred, people leaked risk information. People knew that this person was a high risk. And so what that tells me is that we have a tremendous opportunity to intervene and disrupt, but we have to jump when we have those windows. And so Chris, I will No, and, then I, and I think what we've discovered with these um, ideologically, the ideology cases is that as a prosecutor, you can see he's making a threat to uh, assault a woman. He's like, I'm gonna find a woman, I'm gonna assault her randomly. That's not a really a prosecutable offense unless there's a specific particular threat. Maybe some states have a broader language, but in Washington State we don't have that. So if someone says, I'm gonna go shoot up a school, unless they name the school and make some specific threat, there's not much we can do about it. And this, is, this kind of fills that gap. We can at least disarm them from carrying out that threat. Um, I don't know if there's any 
potential changes to the legislature for that, but it does seem a little counterintuitive that you can make those generalized threats or say that I'm going to kill, I'm going to go out tonight and kill somebody. As long as I don't name that person, it's not a crime. Well, in this case, the FBI came to us because they didn't have a mechanism to enforce uh, on the neo-Nazi cases because they don't, even though they know that there's a threat, he's been banned from Canada for being part of a terrorist organization. Um, one of the things that, like Sam was saying, that the, the ideology that they aspire to is this acceleration theory, meaning that ran, committing random acts of violence will accelerate the race war. So their ideology is very specific to committing random acts, but then you know, we're in this difficult situation of proving is that immediate threat or are they just talking? Um, I think that one of the things about this work is that we are removing firearms. They can say whatever they want. <laughs> we're not, we're not in, imputing their right to speak out or their First Amendment rights, but we're saying that you can't say you're going to do this stuff, prepare for it, collect weapons to carry it out, um, and so we just remove that risk factor. And we've had a lot of success um, since we began. Um, thankfully, the city of Seattle and King County have agreed to continue to fund us, um, most importantly. And the other is that when you work in this space where forever there's just been a lot of learned helplessness around firearm laws um, and lack of enforcement, we were able to uh, provide information about gaps that were in law, that were already in law clarified other laws and promoted that culture of compliance by ensuring that courts do hold compliance hearings and efforts to move um, the removal upstream uh, in, at, at the time of a domestic violence incident. And none of this would be possible if we didn't take an interdisciplinary lens to this work and kind of follow a public health model. Where I think somebody said yesterday, we're not gonna arrest our way out of you know, these offenses, we really need to think, we need to use uh, research to inform our practices and infuse them into a system that just doesn't function that way. Um, so we've been really grateful to have the opportunity to do this work, and we're really very, very grateful to have the opportunity to share this information with you. We've heard from lots of different cities across the country. We welcome you to reach out to us. We share everything because it's really important that we all work together to address these issues as we can. We have like four minutes, I'm sorry, if you have any questions. Yes, sir. Since you um, had a reporter locally who shined some light on this at the beginning, did you contemplate or, or utilize that reporter and other people in the media to follow up on problems, successes, to have greater publicity? Was that part of your strategy? Well, it's, it's funny. Um, Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. So the question was, we clearly had some media coverage early on, and did that help our efforts, and did we kind of use those pathways to continue to shine a light on our successes? And I think, interestingly, it was very coincidental that Chris Ingalls from King 5 was looking at that individual case at the time when nothing was happening. And I think he got hooked. Um, because it was happening at the same time that we were banding our unit together. And so he, he, followed he followed our unit and followed our, so it was like kind of a stroke of genius, but it could have gone terribly wrong at the same time. Uh, and then he recently picked up the uh, neo-Nazi case that happened. And so it's just, like I said, I use this term learned helplessness because I feel like in our nation, it's like, oh, we can't, we can't do anything about firearms. There's too much resistance. And I think what we're saying is that there is absolutely something you can do in this space. And the beauty of our intervention is this is court ordered, people who are court ordered prohibited. Um, this is very targeted intervention from people who are high risk. Um, so all of this information works nicely <laughs> together to make sure that we share that message across a broad audience that we're just really trying to eliminate risk as much as we can up front. And, and to add to what uh, Sandra's saying is that we're, we're not focused on incarceration, we're not focused on charging. We need to charge some cases out of our unit, but very, very few. And we've had this philosophical discussion where we have a person who <coughs> walks in and turns in nine firearms and he's got a prohibited possessor from previous family. We decide that we're, we want to 
encourage them to turn their firearms over. We can obviously prosecute him, or we could we, we make decisions all the time. We're going to arrest him, or do we want the firearms? And we, we, we've taken the path where we just want to make sure that we keep the victim safe and we're not focused on the arrest. That's kind of our, been our path since 2018. Have you run into any issues with people saying my status has changed? I'm entitled to have my firearms back. Well, we're, we're so new. That well, and, and <laughs> typically these are civil orders that people are subject to, whether it's ERPO or the um, Civil Domestic Violence Protection Order. It's one year. Um, and it can be renewable, and so people do have the right. It's kind of like putting <coughs> a pause button during a period of high risk. And so people can come in and ask for the firearms to be returned after that order expires, um, barring any other prohibiting or disqualifying offense. Um, but people- Have people actually done that? Or is it, uh, some people have got their guns back. Yeah, yeah, some people have gotten their guns back. Um, through the Extreme Risk Protection Order, by statute, the restrained party has the right to come in and try to terminate it at least one time during the life of the order. We haven't seen a lot of them, but perhaps a compelling argument to your point would be somebody saying, hey, I got the help that I needed, I'm stabilized, and I'd like the order to be withdrawn. We've only seen maybe one or two termination requests, and it was really, they didn't provide anything of substance to say that there was no longer a risk. Yes? Yeah, what is the uh, breakdown, the 1,100 uh, firearms you covered in the, in the first two years? What's the breakdown with the DV cases versus those other categories mentioned as possible orders? Right, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So what we are seeing is that we are sick, we are disproportionately successful in recovering on extreme risk protection orders and less so on the DVs. And if you think about that, when law enforcement is initiating the extreme risk protection order, um, sometimes they're initiating it after firearms have been removed for safekeeping. So it's kind of ensuring that those firearms don't get turned away. Um, and law enforcement has resources to do that investigation. On the domestic violence protection orders, we are recovering, I don't know the percentage, um, we're recovering um, to a lesser percentage of cases. We have thousands, I think between that, like to date and the beginning of our unit, we have more than 2,500 cases. And so that's, but that doesn't mean that every case has firearms, if that makes sense. But I think that's an excellent question.